try and keep an eye on the time, is to talk about this subject, which is a subject that I've become increasingly interested in in the last um, year or two, but, but in which I don't think that I would really claim to be an expert, and perhaps not nearly as expert as some of you, but to talk about it for 20 or 25 minutes, say until about half past one, and then throw the whole thing open for discussion. That's, that's my program. I'm not going to be, I, there is, there, don't be misled by the laptop, I'm not using any sort of PowerPoint, this is simply going to be me speaking, but I've got something on my laptop from which I may quote, which I forgot to print, so uh, <coughs> uh, the laptop is open. Um, and um, if I just give you the, um, the, uh, the, the format of this at the outset, I'm going to say something by way of introduction to the problem, something about international environmental issues generally. Then I'm going to deal with um, existing methods of dispute resolution and consider the extent to which they might be applicable to environmental issues. Um, and then I'm going to discuss in a little bit more detail the new proposal for an international court for the environment. You will already have noticed that the um, initials would be ICE, ICE, which is, I'm sure you'll agree, quite a good name for an institution um, coming into existence at a time when global warming is really the key um, current issue. Uh, so talk a little bit about that proposal and conclude by telling you about um, some very recent developments in London, some work that I and others have been doing to try to put this um, on a more formal basis, or at least to try to establish um, a, an institution which may one day bring all this about. So that's the, that's the root map. So a few introductory words first, and let me begin by reminding you, those of you who have some knowledge of this um, work, that um, a, an English environmental lawyer called Philippe um, Sands um, um, has written a very um, significant tome called Principles of International Environmental Law. And in the foreword to the first edition of that book, um, the uh, former judge of the International Court of Justice, Sir Robert Jennings QC, um, uh, the late Sir Robert Jennings, wrote as follows. It is a trite observation that, in, that environmental problems, although they closely affect municipal laws, are essentially international, and that the main structure of control can therefore be no other than that of international law. Now, uh, Robbie Jennings wrote those words in 1995, many years before the potential effects of climate change had transformed public perceptions of this topic. And yet, even today, after all the many millions of words that have been written on the subject of climate change and its causes and consequences, uh, many people may think that we are not much further forward in establishing in uh, Robbie Jennings' words, a structure of control. And indeed, um, his observation, made in 1995, that the problem is mainly to be solved by legal means, might now seem not so much trite as unorthodox or even bold and slightly eccentric. What can't be doubted, I would suggest, is the scale of the problem. Um, when um, Jennings wrote those words in 1995, the problems were perceived to be mainly in terms of major cases of environmental pollution. Um, uh, by way of example, the um, um, uh, um, incident that occurred in Bhopal in India, which you will be aware of when Union Carbide released many tons of toxic chemical from its plant, killing three and a half thousand people and injuring many thousands more. Uh, proceedings in the United States courts having failed, the parties settled the ensuing litigation in the Indian courts for about $470 million, an average of about $15,000 per deceased person. 
And if you scroll forward to 2006, um, you see in the United States cases brought on the basis of the common law tort of public nuisance by a number of claimants against the five biggest American power companies also failed to get off the ground. So um, there is, I would suggest, um, a, a long-standing issue as to the legal enforceability of um, environmental controls internationally. But that issue has, of course, been given an altogether new and critical focus by recent developments, such as the series of reports by the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and by Sir Nicholas Stern, as he then was on behalf of the United Kingdom government. And very few people now deny the urgency of a solution to these problems, although perhaps even fewer claim to have to hand a, seri a serious and comprehensive set of solutions. And we all know the slow progress that has been made at a series of international meetings, um, and the next one planned for Copenhagen, um, perhaps seems rather unlikely to lead to anything very much more specific. And perhaps this would be a good moment, as I conclude my introductory remarks, just to um, give you this quotation. Um, a friend of mine called um, Lord Anthony Giddens, uh, former director of the London School of Economics, has literally just brought out a book, which I strongly recommend, um, called The Politics of Climate Change. And um, this is a um, monograph um, discussing um, all the various political issues in relation to this important subject, one of which is what he calls the post barley negotiations. And <coughs> with regard to the post barley negotiations, um, he says on page 202 the following, don't hold your breath for the success of the post barley negotiations. They aren't likely to help much in containing global warming. The scale of the enterprise is truly impressive given the very high proportion of the world's nations involved. Yet the very fact of near universal involvement means that agreements will tend to gravitate to the lowest common denominator, producing anodyne results. Uh, just hold that thought, please, about international agreements in this sort of area tending to gravitate to the lowest common denominator and to produce anodyne results, because that's a point that I want to come back to. Now, um, <clears throat> against that um, rather uh, broad, perhaps, and sweeping introduction touching on a range of different issues in the international environmental field. Let me move to review, as I said I would, um, those international legal instruments and institutions which already exist and see how far they have um, helped or might help in facilitating a solution to this problem. Um, as many of you will know, the oldest legal institution dedicated to resolving international disputes is the Permanent Court of Arbitration, established at The Hague by Intergovernmental Agreement in 1899. Uh, this has jurisdiction over disputes where at least one party is a state, and when both parties to this dispute expressly agree to submit their dispute for resolution. But uh, the court has no compulsory jurisdiction, and importantly, its decisions are not made available for public inspection. Um, most importantly of all, we have now, of course, the International Court of Justice, established um, as a successor to the earlier Permanent Court of International Justice in 1945. Um, in this case, <coughs> jurisdiction depends on whether two or more states have consented to its jurisdiction. And although um, <coughs> the International Court of, Court of Justice may accept cases that are environmentally related, and indeed it has 
it, it established in 1993 at the Chamber specifically to deal with environmental issues, no state has ever submitted a dispute to that environmental chamber. Um, in 1992, uh, uh, representatives from 176 states and several thousand NGOs, non-governmental organizations, met in Brazil for the so-called Earth Summit, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, and adopted the Rio Declaration, of which most people have some awareness. Uh, it's worth remembering that Principle 10 of the Rio Declaration provides as follows. States shall facilitate and encourage public awareness and participation by making information more widely available. Effective access to judicial and administrative proceedings, including redress and remedy, shall be available. That um, declaration, the Rio Declaration of 1992, and its accompanying framework convention on climate change, led on in 1997 to the Kyoto Protocol, signed in Japan on the 11th of December of that year. And that protocol, as many of you will know, for the first time contained international obligations requiring countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions below specified levels. And um, uh, in due course, after being ratified by a sufficient number of the countries of the world, the Kyoto Protocol came into force um, and um, was finally ratified by Australia in December 2007 after a change of government, leaving the United States of America as the only developed nation not to have ratified. And uh, of course, we also have um, now the European Union, we have um, the European Court of Justice, uh, and we have significant developments in <coughs> environmental law within the European Union. But um, the picture I would suggest remains um, a picture which is uh, patchy and in which, um, to repeat um, Tony Giddens' words, um, many, if not all, of these international instruments um, gravitate to the lowest common denominator producing anodyne results. And it was against this background that I moved to try to say something briefly about the genesis of the proposal that we're now talking about. It was against this background that um, the proposal was made for the establishment of an international court for the environment as a body that could add to the jurisprudence in international environmental law and provide a forum both for states and for non-state parties. Ideally, such a court would be compulsory and would include such um, aspects as an international convention on the right to a healthy environment with fairly broad coverage, direct access by NGOs and private parties as well as states, transparency in proceedings, a scientific body to assess technical issues, and some sort of mechanism to avoid forum shopping. Now, I should say straight away that this is not a wholly new idea. Various groups over the last 20 years or so have discussed it. There was a conference in Washington in 1999, um, uh, which came forward with some proposals. And um, those proposals included the following, quite an interesting list, adjudicating on significant environmental disputes involving the responsibility of members of the international community, adjudicating on disputes between private and public parties with an appreciable magnitude, ordering emergency injunctive and preventative measures as necessary, mediating and arbitrating in environmental disputes, and instituting investigations where necessary to address environmental problems of significance. And I think a comparable 
discussion has been evolving in um, Italy, where um, some sort of foundation has been in existence for quite some time, although um, not uh, nothing nothing very concrete has been achieved. And um, so the, the issue has been under discussion. At the same time, and I think this is worth uh, perhaps mentioning at this point, at the same time, uh, we have also seen one quite significant development which um, um, someone raised with me just before I started speaking, which is the establishment of the International Criminal Court. Now, um, I don't want to suggest that there is necessarily a close um, analogy between uh, the role of an International Court for the Environment and the role of the International Criminal Court. Um, the International Criminal Court is designed um, to adjudicate on um, cases brought against particular individuals in respect of war crimes and matters of that kind. And um, it, um, uh, it, 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 its jurisdiction, as I say, is self-evidently a criminal jurisdiction. Um, on the other hand, um, there are two features of the way that the International Court has been set up, which I think are of very considerable relevance. One feature, uh, and uh, there may be people here who know much more about this than me, I'm, I'm, I'm learning uh, about this at the moment, but one feature of the, the way in which the International Criminal Court came into existence is that um, the, the impetus for it came about as a result of uh, a coalition of a large number of interested bodies, especially NGOs, I gather, who, who succeeded in mounting pressure for something which was um, ultimately accepted as being morally right, morally just, and indeed morally essential <coughs> if um, um, civilized behavior, um, <coughs> civilized international behavior is to be, is, is to be enhanced. So the, the, the form of pressure by which that body came into existence is important. And likewise, of course, this is the second point, that the, the way in which eventually it was set up um, through the United Nations and by means of um, an international instrument um, developed um, as an adjunct, so to speak, to the United Nations is, is, is extremely important and, and would obviously constitute a potential precedent for an international Court for the environment. Um, and, and so to those who say, well, this is all a complete pipe dream and, it, and, and there isn't um, a cat's chance in hell uh, of, of any of this ever happening, um, I think one answer to that question, there are a number of answers, um, one of them I think uh, in modern American political parl parlance is simply, yes, we can, but um, uh, another answer is, well, look at how in the course of a decade or so, in the course of 10 or 15 years, um, the International Criminal Court came into existence, which nobody would ever have thought possible. Um, another answer, by the way, digressing slightly from my script now, uh, to those who say that this is an area where legal regulation um, simply has no chance at all of ever being accepted or adopted is to look at what has happened in relation to smoking. Uh, Twenty years ago, nobody would have assumed that it would be possible for um, the civilized countries of the world to adopt a legal regime in relation to smoking, which would um, have any serious impact on the problem. But, but in quite a short space of time, uh, social and cultural attitudes in, in, in relation to smoking have changed completely. Um, many countries are increasingly adopting more rigorous regulatory regimes in relation to smoking, and that has been brought about by a change in culture. It's been brought about partly also, incidentally, by litigation, because although the litigation hasn't been wholly successful, certainly not in, um, in England, um, it, uh, the, um, the pressure brought about by litigation, both in England and in the States and maybe elsewhere, and the disclosures obtained through litigation have helped to 
um, secure some of those legal changes. So um, I think yes, we can is not is not a, 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 an entirely sort of trite message in relation to some of these really serious problems. Now, um, I've said a bit about about what the proposal for an international court for the environment might might involve. Let me just identify, if I may, a, a particular issue, just as an illustration. I mean, this may or may not be a, a good example, but it, but I think it is an example of where um, international adjudication could play a key part. Um, and this is an issue of which I have become aware recently, mainly from um, mainly from what I read in the press. So so probably most of you have spotted this point too. Um, consider the carbon emissions um, on the part of um, China, uh, which everybody knows is a, is a very big issue indeed. I mean, China and the United States between them account for very roughly half of all the carbon emissions that are now occurring. And I think that, again, in very, very round terms, they split, they split the, um, the, the thing between them. Each of them is responsible for roughly a quarter. The Chinese have been catching up, so to speak, and although, of course, there are many more, there are about five times as many people in China, so per capita, the Chinese are doing much better than the United <coughs> States, but, but in aggregate, the Chinese are responsible for a quarter of the United States, for another quarter of the rest of the world, including, including ourselves for the, for, 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 for the balance. Um, but um, according to a recent study, Half the recent rise in China's carbon dioxide emissions is caused by the manufacturing of goods for other countries, particularly developed nations such as the United States, uh, the UK, and no doubt the Republic of Ireland. And last year, uh, in fact, uh, now I come to think of it, this little pen, um, which I bought on my Aer Lingus flight this morning, the 10 o'clock flight from London, um, came in a box which said, made in China. Um, last year, um, China officially overtook the United States, um, uh, it says here, as the world's biggest <coughs> CO2 emitter. But about one third of all Chinese emissions are the result of producing goods for export. And um, I suspect that this is going to be, not just China, but the, gen the generic issue um, is going to be um, a key part of the discussions at Copenhagen, um, the next international meeting and beyond. Because um, all developing countries, especially the bigger ones like China and India, are going to come under pressure to commit themselves, which they have not hitherto done, to binding emissions cuts. As you know, the Kyoto Protocol only applies to developed countries. It doesn't impose limits on um, the developing world. But the developing countries are understandably resistant, um, partly through self-interest and partly because they make the legitimate point that um, uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, growth in their own emissions has been significant in relation to the production of goods for foreign markets. And um, uh, um, uh, by way of example, of, uh, a further example of the impact of this, although um, I gather, although the United Kingdom can claim to have reduced emissions by about 18% since 1990, which is sufficient to achieve its Kyoto target, if you were to um, take into account um, the international impact of the United Kingdom economy, then um, what you would actually see is a real change for the United Kingdom in, in terms of a rise of more than 20%. So if you factor in the, as it were, the international impact of what we're doing, um, you get a very, very different picture. Now, uh, how, I, how I would relate this to the subject that, that, um, that we've been discussing is that it seems to me that if, to go back to Tony Yin's words, what comes out of um, an international discussion such as we're going to see at Copenhagen, if the most that we can reasonably expect to come out of that discussion in this sort of area 
is a, an anodyne result, a form of words, a lowest common denominator. And I dare say that most commentators would say that that's that we'll be lucky if we get even that. But suppose that's what we get. It seems to me that what we then need uh, is an institution, um, preferably set up by international agreement, but if not, then an institution which is um, brought into being by those who believe it's important and which is um, manned, peopled, um, staffed by persons of sufficient international standing, which can um, put flesh on the bones of an anodyne common denominator, which can um, adjudicate in more specific terms as to how generalised propositions about um, environmental regulation ought to be applied in practice, which, which can decide uh, and declare how a, a problem such as the international economic impact that one country has upon another, how that should be reflected in um, specific environmental controls within national borders. Um, somebody in the end has got to set about addressing that problem. And if the most that we can expect from the politicians, and no doubt this is likely, and certainly this is what Tony Giddens thinks is likely after having studied the subject, if the most that we can expect is a lowest common denominator, then somebody has got to work out what that really means in practice. And some form of declaratory adjudication seems to me to be the way forward uh, and, and seems to be a possible contribution by the legal community. Now let me briefly conclude um, by telling you a little bit about what we've been doing in London to try to take this forward. Um, last November, on the 28th of November, to be precise, at the British Library, my um, London Chambers organised a symposium. Um, the um, title of the event was Climate Change and the New World Order. We had a number of speakers, um, both political and non-political. had about 120 people there, I think. And um, there was a general consensus that uh, an idea along these lines very much deserved exploring. Uh, that has led on to a series of um, small meetings since, and um, we're going to hold another uh, reasonably um, big tent sort of meeting at Westminster on the 20th of April. And the plan as it has evolved so far is to try to set up something that I think we're likely to call a coalition for an international court for the environment. And um, we, have, we have two sort of subgroups working on this at the moment. One um, dealing with policy, which is trying to draft a sort of constitution for the court, trying to draft what, what the structure would actually be, and another sort of campaign group, which is trying to work out what you need to do actually to bring this into existence, how you would raise funding, how you would attract support, and so on. And um, with, within that group, we have people who have knowledge of the way the International Criminal Court came into existence. Um, but in the barest outline, and I'll abbreviate this so as to um, come to my conclusion, um, one possible approach, which the policy group has <coughs> suggested, is that this body might sit above and adjudicate upon um, disputes arising out of um, international environmental treaties, such as the Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity of 1992, the Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1982, and other applicable United Nations environmental instruments and possibly also customary international law and uh, ultimately perhaps to incorporate the work being carried on by 
such existing bodies as there may be, for instance, the Kyoto Protocol Enforcement Branch, or alternatively, to, to have a jurisdiction which, which acknowledges those limited um, uh, adjudicatory bodies which may continue to exist. So the two, the two, um, the two jurisdictions sit appropriately side by side. And the aim would be, and I'll um, abbreviate this and we can go into it further, uh, to, to have jurisdiction over the territories of signatory states, to have jurisdiction over the states themselves, over um, um, other legal entities within those states, and possibly uh, uh, also in respect of actions and activity, even in non-signatory states, and to, to grant jurisdiction by way of claim to signatory states, to NGOs, and to private individuals, and to grant remedies such as declaratory relief, um, sanctions, or orders for restoration and rehabilitation of damaged habitats, which I think is a a form of remedy already established under EU environmental law um, and perhaps other, other potential remedies.